So in this section, we're going to actually talk a little more about the chi-square test. That's what I alluded to in the last section and said in the situation where you're comparing two proportions, it's mathematically essentially equivalent to the two-sample z-test, which is a little easier to do by hand. But let's just talk a little bit about the mechanics of the chi-square test and talk about situations where it has high utility. From our hypothesis testing problem so far, we are speaking of testing the equality of two population proportions using data from two samples. The null hypothesis can be written as P1, the underlying true proportion in population 1, is equal to the P2, the underlying true proportion in population 2, and the alternative that those two proportions at the population level are not equal. This can also be written in terms of the difference of proportions that P1 minus P2 equals zero. That's equivalent to saying P1 equals P2. In the context of a two by two table, we are testing whether there's a relationship between the rows and columns in the table. So in our examples that we've worked on so far of HIV status of infants and treatment given to the mothers, we're testing whether there's a relationship between the HIV status of the infants and the treatment given to the mother. What we alluded to before is more formally called Pearson's chi-square test, named after the statistician Carl Pearson. The calculation is relatively easy. It can also be done by hand, like the two-sample z-test, although it's a little more involved. And just like the two-sample z-test, it works well for big sample sizes. And remember, we talked loosely in Lecture 3 about what constitutes a big sample versus smaller sample for binary data. And we're not going to make you make that distinction. We'll talk about small sample inferences later on, but we're not going to require you to make the distinction of whether you have a big sample or not. And this gives essentially the same p-value as that z-test for comparing two proportions. Unlike the z-test, so why do we even talk about the chi-square? Well, unlike the z-test, it can be extended to compare proportions between more than two independent groups in one test, sort of the analog to analysis of variance but when we're dealing with binary outcomes. So how does this chi-squared approximate method work? Well, like any other testing situation we've done, it looks at what we observe between what we'd expect if the null were true, and it does it via the eyes of the two-by-two two table. And what we can do, actually, in the two-by-two two table context is for each of our four cells, we can compute a corresponding expected cell count if the null of equality of proportions were true to compare to the observed cell count we got in our study. And the way we compute an expected cell count is we take the row total for the cell times the column total over the grand total. Think about this for a minute. Does that make sense as a way to compute the number of subjects in the cell we would expect if the null were true? We'll talk about this more in live talk. But see if you can figure out the logic behind this. And again, expected refers to those values for the cell counts that would be expected were the null hypothesis true, if the underlying proportions at the population level were equal. So then, how do we do this? We compute these expected values. We've got our observed values. And what we do to do the hypothesis test is we take the same approach structurally we've been taking since we started talking about hypothesis tests. So we first start by assuming the null is true. We measure the distance of our sample result from the null. But here, the way we do that is we actually measure the distance in each of the four cells between what we observed and what we'd expected, and then we standardize it by the units of variation. And the format is slightly different, but the distance measure we compute, which aggregates these distances across the four cells and standardizes them by some measure of their variability is we take, for each cell, we take the difference between our observed and expected value, we square that, we divide by the expected value of the cell, that's the standardized distance for that cell, and we add that up across the four cells in the table. And then we compare this distance to the appropriate distribution of what we'd expect this distance to look like under the null to see if we have something extreme or not. Do we have something far away when the null is true? or close, and we use that to get a p-value. It turns out the sampling distribution of this statistic, it's related to a normal distribution, but it's slightly different than ones we've seen before. It's called a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. We can use this distribution to determine how likely it would be to get such a big discrepancy between what we saw on our 2x2 two two table versus what we were expected if the null were true, how likely it would be get to get that 
under random sampling if the null were true. Here's a picture of what the chi-squared curve looks like. It's heavily right skewed. Unlike the normal, it's not bell-shaped and symmetric. But the idea is the same. We find out where we are under that curve relative to the rest of the points and characterize our result as extreme or not extreme based on the proportion of results we could have gotten that are as far away or farther. So let's show this computationally. Here's the 2 by 2 setup for the HIV infant transmission AZT study. Here are the observed cell counts for the study. The observed cell count for cell 1 is 13. That is, there were 13 infants whose mother were given AZT who contracted HIV within 18 months of birth. Let's calculate the expected value under the null that the proportion of infants contracting HIV is the same at the process or population level between the AZT and placebo groups. So if we do this by our computation, taking the row total times the column total, dividing by the overall grand total, that would give us 53 times 180 over 363, gives us an expected count of about 26 infants. 26.3 is what the computation says. This is a theoretical number where the null or true, so we can have non-integer values. We could do the same for the other three cells. And actually, once you have one of the four cells, you can get the other three. You don't have to go through that formula again. You could just get them by subtracting from the row or column totals appropriately. But you can see that under the null, we had about the same number of infants in each of the two groups. And under the null, we'd expect about the same number of cases of HIV. So that makes perfect sense if there were no difference in the proportion contracting HIV between the AZT placebo, which is the null, we'd expect to see the same proportion in each group, which turns out to be about the same number because the groups are similar in size. So if we computed this test statistic, this distance, we actually then did this computation, which I'll never expect you to do by hand. I just want you to understand the idea behind it. We get a cumulative discrepancy of 15.6 across the four cells. So is that far away? from what we'd expect under the null or not? Well, we have to look at where it falls relative to the distribution of this statistic under random sampling were the null true. If you look at that, it's pretty far on the right-hand tail there. And we're only going to consider results as far or farther away in terms of as likely or unlikely, and we get a very small swath of area under that curve. But I don't expect you to know how to do this with a table. Some people, if they're old school, would insist on looking this up in a table, but we can refer to the computers for the real-life scenario. So you'll again remind you, we already looked at this before, but now we've seen where the numbers come from. Using the CSI command here down at the bottom, it gives us that chi-squared discrepancy measure of 15.6 there, which is just a really a middle value. And then it also gives us the corresponding p-value, which it comes in at 0.001. So let's just summarize all this. How do we compare proportions between two populations from two samples? Well, the confidence interval approach is consistent. We take the observed difference in proportions, it's our best estimate, and we add and subtract two estimated standard errors via the formula that I gave you back in lecture one. To get a p-value for testing the null that the proportions are equal at the population level, which can be re-expressed as the difference in proportions is zero, we can use either the two-sample z-test approach or the chi-squared test approach, and they give essentially the same p-value. The one that's easier to do on the fly would be the two-sample z approach, and I can tell you straight up I will never expect you to do the chi-squared test by hand. I just want you to know what it's used for and how to interpret the results. One nicety of the chi-squared that the two-sample Z doesn't have property-wise is the chi-square test can be extended to test for differences in proportions across more than two independent populations in one test. As I said in the beginning, it's the analogous to ANOVA with binary outcomes instead of continuous. So here's an example from a recent American Journal of Public Health paper looking at health care indicators by immigration status had a large national survey of American families and classified them into one of four groups. U.S. born with citizen parents or non-citizen parents, this is for uh, children, or foreign born 
and citizens or non-citizens. So there's four different groups we're comparing here on these health status indicators. I'm just going to zoom in on one part here just so you can see it. And what is shown in this table in each column is the proportion of the sample defined by that column that has the characteristic in the row. Notice at the bottom it gives some clarification and then it says all chi-squared p's were less than 0.05. So each of these things in the row was tested whether the proportions were equal across all four groups, that would be the null versus the alternative that at least one was different. And they were all statistically significant at the 0.05 level. So for example, if we looked at the lack of medical insurance at any time in the past 12 months, it gives the observed proportions in each of these groups. The standard error is what it reports here in parentheses. And then we know that the chi-squared test says that at least one of these proportions is different than the others after accounting for sampling variability. If we wanted to figure out how different and which proportions were different than each other after accounting for sampling variability, then we'd have to go on and do confidence intervals for the proportion of each group and see whether they overlapped or test for differences between each pairing. So if you're interested in pursuing this further, you have enough information here to do it. But otherwise, at this point, we could say that lack of medical insurance for children in U.S. families is associated with their immigration status, but we can't say much more than that. However, reporting these summary statistics is helpful in at least getting a sense of which group has higher and lower observed values to complement the fact that the difference is statistically significant.